Jeff Sessions is going to take over for uh, Loretta Lynch and shit is going to change. Uh, Wes Lowry uh, wrote a book called They Can't Kill Us All and uh, this is the interview that he did with uh, Chris Hayes. We'll take over from Loretta Lynch. She's the second African-American to hold that office after Eric Holder preceded her under President Obama. And as this changing of the guard happens, it presents questions for organizations focused on racial justice, including Black Lives Matter, a group which Donald Trump said during the campaign may instruct his attorney general to investigate. Earlier, Chris Hayes sat down with The Washington Post Wes Lowry to discuss what Lowry calls a new era in America's racial justice movement in his new book, They Can't Kill Us All. Let me start with my enthusiastic endorsement of the book, which is fantastic. It's a, it, everyone should read it. It's incredibly well reported and, and, and very well done. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Let's start with this. I mean, how does this movement start? What is this movement and how does it start? Of course, I mean, I think that when we think about the movement, kind of the racial justice movement currently, whether you call it Black Lives Matter or the movement for black lives, however you want to kind of describe it, it begins in the minds and the hearts of these young black and brown men and women um, largely uh, in 2012 and 2013 uh, during the Trayvon Martin incident. And remember at the time, we thought this was going to be the trial of the century. It was going to be an OJ level event uh, on race in America. There were predictions of riots if George Zimmerman was acquitted. And, and rather, uh, there was a lot of protests, there was a lot of vigils, there was a lot of demonstrations. Uh, and black America largely decided to sit and wait and see what would happen. They wanted him arrested and he was arrested. They wanted him tried and he was tried. And then when George Zimmerman was acquitted for the death of Trayvon Martin, there was nothing. There was no violence. There was no large of protests, but rather there was this disappointment in so many people who had felt like we let the system work, we let it play out, and we were failed. And then we fast forward two years to Ferguson, right, where, where now we're starting to see, uh, this comes a few months after the death of Eric Garner and the video that's gone viral, and here we have a young black man whose body is laying in the street for four and a half hours, uh, baking in the summer sun, and the police refusing to say why this man's been killed. Uh, and that was the moment that, um, for both the residents in Ferguson, as well as kind of simultaneously for a lot of young people around the country, there was no longer the willingness to wait and see. You know, I have to say that when you sort of zoom out from the, for, for, from the individual cases and, yeah. and, the, and the activism and look at sort of the broader political um, context, you know, Barack Obama very famously talked about Trayvon Martin and said, by the sun, he looked like Trayvon. Mm -hmm. And that produced tremendous backlash, of course. Uh, a lot from, I would say, white conservatives mm -hmm. primarily. And it's also just, why is it the case, do you think, this movement happened at this moment in the history of this nation's racial struggle with the first black president. Well, when you look at Barack Obama, right, we at all, and everyone projected onto him, and I think people on both sides of the, of the political spectrum projected onto him this desire to be abdicated of our responsibility as it relates to race, right? That this was going to usher in some type of post-racial time. And, and, and look, the well, we've done it. Yeah, we had him. There's a black guy. He's the president. Yeah. What else could we yeah. do? And, and on top of that, his his oratory skills, his rhetoric, he, the way he campaigned certainly attributed to that, right? That his DNC speech, he's talking about we don't have a black America and a white America. His, the night he's elected president, he's saying we're not a collection of red states and blue states, we're the United States. He, you know, he spouted this like, transformational um, promise that we could be so much better, right? I think that one of the reasons Black Lives Matter and these activists become so mobilized during the Obama years is because of the false promise of a black presidency. Um, our, our friend and the writer, Jelani Cobb, says uh, that there's a, we needed to have a black president to see the limitations of a black right, there's presidency. There's this sort of mismatch of, of, yeah. of the reality that's happening on the ground and the sort of iconography and symbolism of him in that office. I, exactly, of course. And so that, so you have a black president. So many of these young activists, I try to tell the stories of many of them because I, I believe firmly that if you understand one person from Ferguson, one person from Charlotte, one person from Charleston, you can understand everyone in the street, right? So many of them had voted for Barack Obama. Some of them canvassed for him and worked for his campaign, right? And they they believed in the system and working within the system. And then Trayvon Martin was killed, and then Michael Brown was killed, and Eric Garner and Sandra Bland. This idea that voting for Barack Obama or supporting a black man for the presidency had not gotten rid of the threats that their black skin carried with them. And then on the other side of this, we now have the backlash. And the, yeah, the counter. The counter. The counter. We saw the backlash brewing uh, on social media and conservative media in among politicians and uh, Donald Trump, who said he ran as a law and order candidate, who was had very harsh words, uh, not particularly conciliatory, not particularly, uh, you know, interested in sort of racial empathy. Um, he was elected president, and I wonder how much you think this this cat 
and this catalyzed some of that backlash. You know, I think that when we look historically at any moment of massive racial progress, especially as it relates to black Americans in the United States of America, you almost immediately see a phase uh, of a backslide, right? You almost always, whether that be after Reconstruction, whether that be after the Civil Rights Movement, you always see a backlash from the white majority. This feeling that something's being taken from yeah. them or things are changing too quickly or too rapidly. Yeah, it's, 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 it's hard to avoid reading that into the subtext of a lot of what happened in this election. Wes Lowry, uh, They Can't Kill Us All. It's a fantastic book. Go out, go out and read it. Thanks for me. So he summed it up in a nutshell. We are going to go through a white lash period and just the question of how long are we going to have to go through it.